Okay, so uh, let's look at an example uh, with Laplace equation this time. So we're working on a partial differential equations uh, with the method of separation of variable. And we'll look at a Laplace equation example. So the idea of separation of variable, as we discussed in class, very straightforward. Uh, it's really the, uh, the once you separated the variable that you become two ODEs, you make a PDE into two ODEs, and then applying the boundary conditions, which is where all the messy algebra come in. But that's something that you learned already how to deal with, right? It, the algebra, I admit, very messy, but it's something, it is nothing new in that sense. And the idea of separation variable is a new part, but that's relatively easy. Okay, so let's uh, look at this. And as usual, let's analyze the question first. There should be four ingredients to, to all uh, PDE problems. There should be a target function. And in this case, the function is the electrostatic potential, uh, phi. Um, and it is described by this PDE. Um, so we want to always identify the function of interest uh, and its variables. So the function of interest is this. And its domain of validity is kind of hidden. Uh, we have to read this a, read a little bit. Um, and we see that basically it's given with these boundary conditions. So x and y, uh, where x seems to be defined between 0 and pi. And we want to find the voltage or the potential, the electrostatic potential, uh, same thing, um, uh, similar to voltage at, at least, um, inside in between these bounds. So the domain of validity for, uh, for x is between 0 and pi. And the domain for y that we're interested in is between 0 and pi as well. So we have a square. Okay, so we'll draw a diagram in a second. Um, the PDE itself is basically the Laplace equation. We can write it in a shorthand like this for simplicity. Um, and these are the boundary conditions. Let's just uh, list them out. So this part in blue, uh, it's useful to underline. Actually, this includes the little g that is defined here. Um, uh, it So here, it's uh, just keeping it as a more general g. You can solve it once and for all for all g. Uh, at the very end, just plug this in for this question. Just try to be more general. Um, so when you write out a solution, uh, these parts in blue, you don't necessarily need to write them out. Uh, because what you can do is just instead draw a domain diagram as we've shown in class. Um, but I'm just going to summarize this just for completeness. Uh, oops, so it's x is 0, all of them equals to 0. And the fourth boundary condition is when y equals to pi, then this g, phi should equal to g of x. Right, so all of this, um, this is just reminding of the ingredients of a PDE. Uh, but what you... Uh, may just directly do uh, when you approach these problems, let's say in an exam, uh, is directly just draw out, uh, have a quick sketch of the diagram is always helpful from zero to pi and from zero to pi, not particularly to scale, but that's fine. Um, and uh, now you understand that the boundary conditions are defined over here. So on here, uh, this is where x equals to pi. So we look for x equals to uh, pi. Um, x equals to pi, that's that one. It's equals to zero. So here on this edge, phi is zero. On this edge, y equals to pi, uh, phi is equals to g. So phi of x pi uh, is equals to g of x. So over here, there's a profile. There's a profile for this potential, for this electric potential function of uh, g of x, um, and in that case, it's it's that. We might want to plot this separately, but that's fine. Uh, and here, at x equals to 0 for all y, uh, phi is equals to 0 here. And finally, phi is equals to 0 here. And the question is, of course, to find what is phi of x, y in the middle, right? In between, in within this domain that of interest that we're interested in. This initial profile uh, on the edge, um, maybe we'll plot that separately, uh, is if I just plot g of x with respect to x, um, and if we're interested in this, uh, if we multiply this out, this is a parabola, uh, and the roots is at x equals to 0 and at x equals to pi, and it's a parabola with a negative concavity, um, so it's something like this. 
probably a little bit more symmetric. Uh, there we go. Okay, so we essentially that's the potential profile on this wall, uh, and we want to find the middle part. Okay, all right. So uh, to write the solution, we say uh, we use separation of variable. The first step we'll let x y equals to this time x of x y of y. Each of them is just a independent function of a pure variable itself. And now the PDE will imply x, y, uh, double x, right? So this is the, the PDE. Um, I'm just going to use subscripts to denote um, uh, double derivatives, to de denote the partial derivatives with respect to that variable. So the PDE now looks like that. Of course, the derivative on x only acts on x, so the y comes out essentially. So we have um, essentially the derivative only acts on x, the y is not differentiated. And here the derivative acts on y, the x is not differentiated. And now you can divide both sides by x, y, and now you get x double dash uh, over x is equals to, um, or plus y double dash over y equals to zero. And if we now try to separate them in with purely a function of x and purely a function of y, we can have this and define as a equals to a constant. Okay, so we'll call that lambda, uh, which means uh, by the logic of separation of variable, this splits into uh, x double dash equals to uh, lambda x and y double dash equals to minus lambda y. Uh, then we should also write the boundary conditions. Uh, so x of uh, zero, if we look back, this is where this diagram is helpful. You immediately see that for all y, um, x equals zero is equal to zero and x equals to pi is equal to zero. This is for all y, uh, te well, technically not for all y, but for all y within the domain um, of interest. So from zero to pi at least, just lazy. So I'm gonna not gonna write the uh, the little the extra part um just to save a little space and here uh y uh, of zero you see is also zero uh, for all x uh, now I have space I'll write that in here uh, let me just borrow this <laughs> to be a little bit lazy uh, okay so uh, right so these are the boundary conditions and finally we have the last boundary condition we will implement that separately because um, that will need both the x and y together. Uh, you cannot just look at the, um, equate the y to a function of x. So we'll deal with that last, okay? So now um, having this, we need to decide which one to solve first. We need to identify a sturm liouville problem. Um, which one looks like a sturm liouville problem, the x or the y? Well, it's the x that looks like a sturm liouville problem because you have um, regular sturm liouville boundary conditions. Okay, so you remember the definition for regular boundary, uh, regular sturm liouville boundary conditions, right? So this is a homogeneous, regular, uh, regular homogeneous sturm liouville boundary conditions, which means um, we'll solve the x equations first. And uh, if we have lambda uh, is larger than zero, um, we have, uh, so we have three cases, lambda equals zero, lambda larger than zero, or lambda less than zero. Lambda larger than zero means it takes hyperbolic or exponential solutions. Um, let's do cosh. Uh, we can directly write this down at this point. Um, at this point in the course, you should be familiar enough uh, for basically this is a simple harmonic uh, equation with very for the three cases, you can directly write them down. Um, this is a linear solution and this is a trigonometry solution. Okay. And this is hyperbolic functions. You need these two points to be zero. It's impossible. Um, for this, you need these two points to be zero. It's impossible. So um, we can show, uh, by the way, this is already separation of variable. This is the key part. Everything else is almost just the Nobel problem. Okay. Right, so now this time we, yeah, so we can uh, say larger than zero and equals zero case 
implies x of x is identically zero, which means it's trivial, because that means, uh, if you want, that means phi of x, y equals to zero, um, because that's equal to x times y, right? The, the function of capital X and capital Y, uh, if that is zero, that is zero, that gives you trivial solutions because of course that solves the PDE. If X is zero, that's that's not news to anyone. So um, yeah, that is not needed in our solution. What we're interested in is this case. Uh, this implies, um, well, these. Well, okay, so now let's apply the boundary condition directly for this. Let's apply the boundary condition one. Uh, let's call that x0 equals zero. So I'll call that one to be my boundary condition one. That means, um, well, x of zero, plugging this in, uh, it gives me e plus zero. And I want that to equal to, so I demand that to equal to zero, which means e is zero. Okay. Boundary condition two tells me x of pi equals to zero, which means I want, uh, well, what is x of pi? If uh, e is zero, so I can directly just write f sine root of negative lambda pi. I want that to be zero. Um, f better not be zero because otherwise it's trivial. Uh, so with f not equals to zero, or let's write that separately. So f not equals to zero implies this better equals to any integer multiples of pi, uh, which means I can easily calculate this to be uh, negative n squared. Okay. And this we can define as our eigenvalues of lambda n uh, and the eigenfunctions would be x of x would be f sine uh, square root of that is just n. So we just have n pi, right? And this is, uh, we can ex copy it, extract out uh, the f and define basically our eigenfunctions to be uh, these. Okay, good, not bad. Now uh, we have our, we apply two boundary conditions. We can now proceed to solve the y equation, okay? So the y equation, okay, this is technically singular. <laughs> uh, we have uh, the y equation is y double dash plus this, um, which means uh, we have already solved for uh, the lambda. The lambdas are n square, right? So we already have these, uh, this value for lambda and we know it's positive. So there's no cases unlike the x equations. We directly know y of y has to be, uh, where are we up to? A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, let's do G. Uh, we know it has to be a cosh of ny and cinch of ny, the hyperbolic functions or exponentials. But because we're going to apply the boundary conditions at zero, so y of zero equals to zero. This is for all x within the domain of validity, right? So we'll call this boundary condition three and then to say three, right? So this boundary condition applies a zero. Cosh and cinch is much better than uh, exponentials. So uh, this would imply y of zero, right? Uh, y of zero, plugging this in. So g of cosh zero is one and h of cos zero is zero, and I demand this to equal to zero, which means g is zero. And we are left with y of y is h cinch and y like that, okay? Uh, so we have one more uh, constant left over here. Um, uh, if we uh, put it back together for the whole thing first, uh, because now uh, these are, there's a lot of infinite eigenfunctions that are solutions depending on the n. We need to sum over all possible n's. Uh, to avoid duplication, um, we just need to go from n equals to one to infinity because if n equals zero, uh, we have a trivial solution and n equals to negative basically just duplicates with it because cinch and sines are both odd functions. So there's a symmetry which duplicates um, to 
uh, duplicates it. So we just need to avoid any double counting. Um, we can simplify that from one to infinity and have uh, F sine uh, F sine nx uh, and H sint ny. Of course, we can group these constants together. Uh, let's call the F and H together. Let's call that just K. Um, uh, define that as K. Uh, and there can be an N dependence because this is just linear combinations of any solutions or solutions. So uh, this is the general solution. A partially partially specific <laughs> solution. And we still have one more boundary condition. So we applied boundary condition one. We applied boundary condition two. Uh, we apply boundary condition three, fixing some of the constants. And finally, right, we need to apply boundary condition four, which is uh, phi of x zero, no, x pi is equals to gx. We'll substitute gx last. So we can, uh, we can the, the explicit form of gx last. Uh, so we can, um, yeah, keep it general for now. Uh, slightly bad choice of G, <laughs> probably in hindsight should use a different variable. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, okay, uh, so what does that mean? Uh, well, uh, X pi, uh, we want, um, well, phi of X pi, let's plug that in the general solution. So let's, uh, let's indicate this is still a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not completely specific solution, right? So it's still a general solution. I mean, it's semi semi general, let's say, <laughs> semi specific. We've solved for a couple of constants already and reduced to just one last one, but still a general one, right? So to get a specific solution, apply the last boundary condition, right? Uh, so we put in pi. Uh, so that is, um, and from one to infinity, uh, kn sine of n pi, no, nx, because we want to apply pi uh, over here. Uh, n pi, cinch of n pi, like that, uh, equals to uh, zero. No, not equals zero, equals to g. So we want this to equals to gx. Okay, so this we demand this to equals to gx. So gx is given, it's just, I'm just keeping it abstract over here. How, what are we trying to solve? What is the goal? Well, the goal is to solve for Kn. So we do the standard projection and find the uh, orthogonal combinations for uh, for this, right? So just as a side, right? So it's useful to have these on the side and know these identities. This is a useful identity to know. Um, yeah, there's something I can simplify here before we get to this, but still, uh, let me write, write this out first. And pi over L, X. Um, right, so uh, this, of course, we want a weighting function of one, and uh, X is between the bounds of minus L and L, which means from minus L to L of sine M pi X over L, sine M pi X over L, uh, dx, this would give me um, L delta nm, right? So this is something that's given in the formula sheet, or if you use that enough by now, you'll remind. It's it's a useful thing to, to remember if you do it a lot. Um, but before that, uh, yeah. Right, so, so there we go. Um, so how can we make use of this? Well, we can uh, try to project it out by multiplying the orthogonal uh, relationship, or orthogonal combination for uh, sine. Okay, so we uh, integrate. Well, first we, we multiply and then we integrate, but we'll do that in one go. Um, we multiply the orthogonal combination. So sine uh, nx, we multiply a sine mx over here, cinch n pi, and we will want that to equal to integrate gx 
sine mx. That, that's the orthogonal combination with this. Okay, so now we have a left and a right. The left-hand side is orthogonal, so we can uh, try to do that first. Um, and we, so we'll start with the left-hand side. So what, just to be clear, we are doing this integral after multiplying the sign. And on the right-hand side, we're doing the same thing, multiplying by this on the right-hand side uh, and integrating on both sides. So start with the left-hand side. Uh, anything that has nothing to do with x, we can pull it out of the integral. So uh, we are, have pulled these parts out and left with minus infinity to uh, infinity, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> not minus infinity. Um, because gx is only defined between zero and pi, the only sensible um, limits, if you want this to be, gx is not defined outside of zero and pi. So this is the limit to that you can apply on both. This is the only limit you can apply on gx, which means this is the only limit you can apply on the left. You have to do the same thing for both sides which means this would be 0 to pi, uh, leaving you with sine nx and sine mx dx. Okay. Of course, the thing in the round brackets gives you, uh, you can, we can uh, do it two ways. You can either, uh, I like to just try to massage this into this. Alternatively, you can massage this into this, right? Um, so, uh, I my preferred way is to think of this as half of going from minus pi to pi sine mx uh, sine mx dx okay okay uh, and now I can directly say this is equals to uh, l being pi to use this identity so this is the orthogonality relationship or identity at this point um, between the signs. Right? And this will directly be pi times delta nm. So alternatively, you can first massage this and write this as z equals to 2 times 0 to l dx because both sine and pi x over l and sine m pi x over l is an odd function so you can you can do that and um and uh equate that to this so just this integral is l over two times that and directly plug it in either way you'll get the same result of one half and this is just pi times delta n m everything in the brackets this basically collapses the whole infinite series into just one term where n equals to m, leaving you with km times pi sinh n m pi over two. So that's your left-hand side done. And we will look at the right-hand side of this equality um, of this demand or this boundary condition. All right, and yeah, so uh, you, uh, we, we just have to know the explicit formula for this to calculate it. So um, G, the right-hand side is, let's just copy this first, sine mx dx. There's no way to proceed other than knowing this, um, but yeah, uh, I will keep, there's nothing else you can do. Um, uh, we at this point I can plug in the our questions gx to do it, but just to keep it completely general, um, I will uh just equate these two together and solve it at the really last moment, right? So just to keep it completely general, um, so therefore, uh, k m times pi sine m pi over two. We want it to equals to this. That's completely fine. Which means k is 2 over pi sinh and pi. 
So I'm just going to replace all the m's to n's because it's a dummy variable. It doesn't really matter which way, which one we call it. Oh, this is x. And uh, we later on need, we need the kn anyway in the phi. So let's put it preemptively as k, n. Okay, so let's copy this part back. So I'll put, put a big round brackets, cinch n pi, this tx sine nx dx, right? So this integral uh, at this point, you probably should just explicitly do it, but I'm just keeping it completely general um, in case it's a different form that you need to work with. Um, but you just solve everything every, every time. Don't use this as general formula because, uh, yeah, you never know uh, what is um, assumed or not. And uh, let's copy everything else. Cinch n y. And uh, there you go. So this is the general solution. Um, well, this is the specific, this is a general specific solution. For, this is a specific solution for a general GH, uh, GX, put it that way. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, I will leave it as an exercise um, for you to calculate this. Uh, and I'll let you know the uh, final answer if, if GX is X times pi minus X, right? Um, then the integral should be, uh, you should get, well, the inter so you should get kn is 4 over um, pi cinch n pi. Okay, so instead of 2, it becomes a 4, just twice uh, times 1 minus minus 1 to the power of n, uh, and over n squared, n cubed, yes. Okay, so that's what that is. And the full solution is, uh, if you would like, you can factor out any actual uh, constants that is independent on the dummy index of n, if you want. It's not completely necessary, but you can. Okay, and you have n cubed cinch n pi sine nx cinch n y. That's the full solution uh, for the specific GX. This is the, well, generally the GX. Okay. All right. So uh, hopefully that is useful. Um, let me know uh, if you have any questions. And uh, yeah, good luck and keep practicing more questions.